I'm Darius Spearman, and you're watching African Elements. Persons of African descent have always had their own set of perspectives on slavery and their own set of agenda items when it came to abolition. Those perspectives are often overlooked when placing emphasis on the white-led abolitionist movement. In this video, we look at some of the voices of African Americans themselves articulating their own agenda and outlook on slavery and freedom in their own words. Welcome back to African Elements, where we make classroom lessons for instructors and online learners and make it freely available to everyone. Once again, I'd like to give a big thanks to our Patreon members for supporting this content. You can join them for as little as a dollar a month to get ad-free content and exclusive videos available only to Patreon subscribers. At various membership tiers, you can also have access to course syllabi, PowerPoint presentations, and entire Canvas course shelves. Or, you can support this channel with a like and subscribe. Be sure to hit that bell icon so that you'll be notified when new content drops. In this video, we'll look at two first-hand accounts that give us a sense of how black and white abolitionists differed in their outlook towards slavery and freedom. First, I have an excerpt from Booker T. Washington's book, Up From Slavery. Born a slave, he learned of his emancipation when he was nine years old. This excerpt is his reflection on the moment a United States officer told a gathering of slaves at the big house that they were free and could go when and where they pleased. He writes, For some minutes there was great rejoicing and thanksgiving and wild scenes of ecstasy. I noticed that by the time they returned to their cabins, there was a change in their feelings. The great responsibility of being free, of having charge of themselves, of having to think and plan for themselves and their children, seemed to take possession of them. It was very much like suddenly turning a youth of 10 or 12 years out into the world to provide for himself. In a few hours, the great questions with which the Anglo-Saxon race had been grappling for centuries had been thrown upon these people to be solved. These were the questions of a home, living, the rearing of children, education, citizenship, and the establishment and support of churches. Was it any wonder that within a few hours the wild rejoicing ceased and a feeling of deep gloom seemed to pervade the slave quarters? To some, it seemed that now they were in actual possession of it, freedom was a more serious thing than they had expected to find. Some of the slaves were 70 or 80 years old. Their best days were gone. They had no strength with which to earn a living in a strange place and among strange people. To this class, the problem seemed especially hard. What can we gather about the experience of newly freed men and women from this short excerpt? First, it seems clear that emancipation was a far more complicated thing than simply saying, okay, you're free now. What does it mean to say you're free to go when and where you please when you have no place to go, no place to earn a living, and in the case of those slaves that are 70 or 80 years old, scarcely any means to earn a living? Sure. You can just go and build your own communities, but build them from what? There were scarcely any schools, self-help institutions, or financial institutions in place to provide support of any kind. All that had to be built from scratch. Whether you agree or disagree with Washington's solution, which I flesh out a bit more here in this video, it's important to understand the depth of the problem that Booker T. Washington set out to address. Again, the depth of these problems what happens after emancipation, were generally not a part of the agenda in the white abolitionist movement. We can see another set of concerns that occupied freed men and women in a letter written by Jordan Anderson only months after the end of the Civil War. A year after finding work in Ohio, Anderson received a letter from his former master asking that he return to work for him on his plantation in Tennessee, where he and his wife had been freed by Union soldiers. The following letter, which was subsequently published in a number of newspapers, is his response. To my old master, Colonel P. H. Henderson, Big Spring, Tennessee. Sir, I got your letter and was glad to find that you had not forgotten Jordan, and that you wanted me to come back and live with you again. Although you shot at me twice before I left you, I did not want to hear of your being hurt, and I'm glad you're still living. I want to know particularly what the good chance is you propose to give me. 
I'm doing tolerably well here. I get $25 a month with victuals and clothing. Now if you'll write and say what wages you will give me, I'll be better able to decide whether it would be to my advantage to move back again. As to my freedom, which you say I can have, there's nothing to be gained on that score, as I got my free papers in 1865 from the Provost Marshal General of the Department of Nashville. Mandy says she would be afraid to go back without some proof that you were disposed to treat us justly and kindly, and we have concluded to test your sincerity by asking you to send us our wages for the time we served you. I served you faithfully for 32 years, and Mandy for 20 years. At $25 a month for me, and $2 a week for Mandy, our earnings would amount to $11,680. Add to this the interest for the time our wages have been kept back. If you fail to pay us for faithful labors in the past, we can have little faith for your promises in the future. In answering this letter, please state if there would be any safety for my Millie and Jane, who are now grown up and both good-looking girls. You know how it was with poor Matilda and Catherine. I would rather stay here and starve and die if it come to that than have my girls brought to shame by the violence and wickedness of their young masters. You'll also please state if there has been any schools open for the colored children in your neighborhood. The great desire of my life now is to give my children an education and have them form virtuous habits. Say howdy to George Carter and thank him for taking the pistol from you when you were shooting at me. From your old servant, Jordan Anderson. As we can see from both of the previous first-hand accounts, education was a key concern for Reconstruction-era Blacks. Not only was the ability to work and support a family a primary concern, but what about back pay? What about reparations? What about a pension for those slaves who had worked their entire lives and now were 70 or 80 years old and unable to earn a living? For the most part, white-led abolitionist movements didn't believe in equality within their own movement and resisted allowing blacks to assume leadership positions in abolitionist organizations. That's to say nothing about the larger issue of social equality. Finally, what about poor Matilda and Catherine? What's Jordan's concern here? Put your thoughts on that in the comments below. In these two first-hand accounts, we see the primary difference that separated black and white abolitionists. With a few exceptions, white abolitionists by and large sought to end slavery, but weren't particularly concerned with citizenship or equal rights. Most of them certainly weren't trying to have their children sit next to black kids in schools. As we can see here though, freedom, absent rights, is meaningless. Thank you for watching, and now it's time for our comment of the week. This one comes from a Patreon member, Cheryl Child, who commented in response to the last upload on the Haitian Revolution. Another expansion of my limited understanding of the slave trade. As I had known nothing of the real reason Napoleon dumped all that territory, I just assumed a culture of ignorance and cruelty, my southern stereotype, fueled the treatment of slaves. Seeing that the torture escalated to the extent that people feared enslavement more than death, that the slaveholders fully recognized their outnumbered peril, makes me wonder what will be this country's next tipping point. Thank you, Cheryl. That's a very poignant question. As we can see, there are a few things more dangerous than when a person's living conditions become so intolerable that the thought of continuing to live in those conditions becomes more fearful than death itself. I very much appreciate your comments and your support. You can join her and support this program for as little as a dollar a month, or just drop a like and subscribe. I'm Darius Spearman, and until next time, I'll see you in the comments.